everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the Bulletproof Dental Practice Podcast. I'm your host today, Dr. Spodak, and I'm really excited to have someone that I have a lot of esteem and regard for, a legend in our field, Dr. Michael Detola. Thank Craig, you. Craig, for- how you doing, man? We're doing great today. Um, we're going to be solo today because Dr. Bolden couldn't make it. Okay. Uh, but we're really happy to have you here. And um, we had a lot of good conversation before I hit record. Finally, I'm like, we have to freaking hit pause because we're going to talk for three hours and I wouldn't have had recorded anything. Yeah, you kept saying off the record and then you'd share something really cool with me. I'm, I'm like, Craig's got to do another podcast called Off the Record, where he actually <laughs> records all the off the record stuff that he said, because that's the fascinating one. That's the, all the stuff. I, but I know you're very transparent about you know, your practice and what kind of numbers you do and how it's working and stuff like that. So it was just off the record in, in terms of like names of people who you know, don't want to slander anybody. Yeah, no worries. No worries. It was... Um... We had, a, we had a couple of good laughs before, and I think this is going to be a great uh, podcast. So really appreciate you being so generous with your time. Um, I have been following you for years when you were with Glidewell and watching all your videos and how you were able to take uh, complicated dental treatments and boil it down for average dentists, like your self-proclaimed average dentist. And I'd like to think of myself as that as well. And um, then also seeing you on stage at the Serona events, man, I was your biggest freaking fan looking up at you when you're interviewing Richard Branson. My God, I, I remember coming up to you at the end of one of those events and be like, Michael, you are in the wrong field. You need to be an entertainer. This is so incredible. I mean, well, yes. you, you know, what's funny is um, uh, I, I interviewed him at that meeting and um, afterwards his assistant came up and said, uh, uh, by the way, Richard just told me that that was, you know, he gets interviewed by a lot of different people and that's about the most funny he said he's ever had doing one of these interviews. And I was like, really? And I was like, well, I, I really enjoyed it too. And then she left and I, I kept thinking about that over the next week. And then a week later, um, I sent them, I sent her a letter uh, with the top 10 reasons why I should become Richard Branson's permanent interviewer. I'm like, you can fly me all over the, wherever we need to go domestically, internationally. I'd like to be his full-time interviewer since he enjoyed it. And, uh, I never heard back, but you know, I figured you got to take a chance every once in a while when you enjoy something like that and, and you have a brush with greatness like that, throw it out there, see what happens. I didn't really expect anything to, uh, to happen with it, but th- that was, um, that was amazing. It was funny because he, he flew in from his, his private Island from Necker Island to, to do that talk on his, um, on his private jet. And so before he got there the day before his assistant was there, and she said, are you going to be wearing a, a tie on stage when you interview him? And I said, yes, I, I will be. And she said, okay, well, don't tell him that I told you this. But one of the things he likes to do, if, if the interviewer is wearing a tie, um, I'm going to give him a pair of scissors beforehand. He's going, to, he's going to cut your tie off. I just want you to know so you won't be wearing like a super nice tie or anything like that. I said, okay, cool. I'll be prepared for that. I'll just wear some ugly Serona tie. That's fine. <laughs> and, um, and then when he landed... In Orlando, um, I got to meet with him like 45 minutes before, and uh, we were talking, and um, I was already wearing my suit and my tie, and he said, uh, hey, can I ask you something? He said, "Uh, is that a nice tie that you're wearing? I said, no, it's just one of our corporate ties. Why? He said, well, don't tell my assistant I told you this, but she'll kill me if she knows I told you this, but when we get on stage, I'm going to I'm going to cut your tie off. And I was like, Oh, okay. I had no idea. Okay. Well, that sounds okay. And I won't tell her you said anything. I still don't know if they both knew that they were both telling, letting me on this secret and saying, don't tell the other one. But uh, so it wasn't very surprising when he came up to me to, to cut the tie off to start the interview. Although he did look like he was coming over to kill me as he was holding these scissors. Yeah. I remember that. (laughs) Yeah, that was great. Um, uh, Amazing interview. And I actually had a, a really lucky event. I brought a friend of mine who, knows Richard Branson and I got him in. I shouldn't admit this. This is the off the record part, but, but I snuck him into the, that interview. Uh, he's not a dentist. And in turn, he wound up inviting me or getting me invited to a week at Necker Island. So I got a chance to hang out with wow. Richard and all those people. It That's was pretty learning. sweet quid pro quo. You think it's the interviewer that I could have got an invite to Necker Island as well, but uh, good for you. That's, um, that's fantastic. He's just, you know, the most surprising thing to me about that interview was, um, I don't know, you just see this um, swashbuckling billionaire, you know, flying balloons around the world and doing all this crazy stuff. I really expected him to be uh, more like brash and loud, 
kind of more like Donald Trump. And I was kind of surprised when I met with him before and he was having a spot of tea, you know, from coming from the jet and we're having some tea together. And uh, <clears throat> he was quiet, kind of unassuming. I thought, oh, he must really turn it on when he goes on stage. But he was quiet there again. And, and it ended up being um, a little more work to kind of like get story, stories out of him. It's not work, but it's I'm glad I had done a lot of work ahead of time preparing. So I knew lots of stuff about him because he's not just the kind of person where you turn him on and he just kind of goes. Um, it, it took some goading to kind of get stories out of him, but um, I, li I like that about him. I like that kind of down to earth nature about him. I like that, um, I guess I, maybe not Donald Trump. I guess I expected more Anthony Robbins, Tony Robbins, another guy we've had at those Serona events before. Uh, but Richard Branson, you just get this really down to earth feeling about him. And he's just all about you know, putting the right employees in place and then getting out of their way, knowing they're going to make mistakes, um, but letting them adjust on their own and hire, hire great people and let them make, you know, good, great, bad decisions and let it all happen and adjust when necessary. But uh, he is loved um, by his employees. You are loved by your employees. Um, how many employees some, do you have in your dental some, practice? Some of them. Uh, we're at like 44, 45 right now. But just, just, to talk, just to talk about Richard, I think that's, you know, we all have this idea about leadership and we all have this view of this iconic leader that's kind of like William Wallace and Braveheart out in the front making a lot of noise. Like, come on, let's ru ru charge into battle. And, and, but there's another form of leadership that sometimes often is, is more effective. And Richard is the epitome of that. Um, and he gets out of the way. So he's the leader that you don't even feel his presence. Uh, I remember like being, I was kite surfing that week down in, in, in Necker uh, Island and he'd come out in the mornings and it was just so regular to see him there. And when he'd go off on his own kiteboarding, I'd ask the other guys, he kites with him. Like, how is he? He's like, he's just the nicest, most humble, kind guy. I, I have one more experience. I remember we were having like a little discussion and there was a microphone because there was like 15 or 20 of us. We were having like a roundtable discussion. I didn't know that Richard had entered the room. So I had my hand up to talk and he was sitting behind me. So they, I stood up and I could see by all the eyes that they were really looking behind me. I turned around. It's Richard. And instead of Richard being like, okay, give me the mic. He's like, no, no, please, please. So he was, he was such a, a gentle, he's such a gentle person and, and so present. Uh, his presence is, is incredible when he's with you. He's just, you know, he's not. Um, he's just very different from what I would assume right. an iconic leader would be. And it just, it gives people a, a larger and greater definition of what leadership can be. It doesn't have to be Tony Robbins or William Wallace or some guy charging out in front. It can be your own authentic yeah. expression. Yeah. Because a lot of us don't necessarily have personalities um, like that. And his other thing is just a, a vision, you know, I mean um, to go back and sell, you know, the idea of Virgin Galactic, you know, starting 15 years ago, it's like, it's kind of insane. And now, you know, Virgin Hotels, Virgin Cruises, and it's, it's, you know, finding, picking these things, knowing they're not all going to work. Um, that was one of the, there was only two things I couldn't ask him about at the interview. He said, if you please don't ask me about two things, um, don't, I don't want to talk about Brexit. And he said, I don't want to talk about Virgin America, which was one of my favorite airlines. I don't think they made much of an impact on the East Coast because they were based in San Francisco. Just an amazing airlines. They had recently just been purchased by Alaska Airlines, almost to just kind of shut them down, you know, just kind of to absorb it and not take on any of their corporate culture just because Virgin America was uh, a stiff competitor for them with better planes, better service. Um, if you've never been on a Virgin America flight, I, I would fly them anywhere I could. They had no beverage carts, you know, blocking you from going to the restroom. Um, so every seat had a screen. They were all leather seats, the entire plane. Remember the lighting inside, the purple yeah, the mood hue. lighting oh, was very so cool. cool. It seems silly, like, oh, what's that going to really do? And you go, oh, no, this, this actually changes how I'm feeling on this plane. But then to pull up on the screen the food and the drink and just be able to order a vodka tonic and, you know, a turkey sandwich. And three minutes later, they bring it to you. And two minutes later, you got like a beer, actually, with the sandwich. And you order a beer, and they bring it to you, and you just swiped your credit card. I mean, just stuff that I don't think we'll see in the rest of the industry for a long time. Those are the only two things he didn't want to talk about. And he did kind of say something about Donald Trump. 
about not really enjoying his presence at a dinner meeting. I go, well, I'm going to add that to your list. You may not want to bring it up. I go, dentists are kind of, uh, well, they're, they're just Republican. I don't know how big a Trump fans they are, but they definitely don't kind of want to vote the other way, mainly for financial, small business uh, reasons. And he did make one comment about Trump, and it kind of got like a few hisses, you know, in the audience when he did it. So um, I, don't, I don't recall, but I remember being at dinner with him at Necker Island, and he's like, he was wearing, it was, uh, we had a theme every night, and that night was Roaring 20, so he was dressed in drag. Um, he was literally wearing lipstick and a dress. And he's sitting there at dinner and he's like, listen, uh, obviously I shouldn't be talking about this because um, Donald Trump had just recently be, became elected. He's like, you know, this is not really polite to talk about this at, at dinner conversation. He looks directly at me and says, and, and you, Craig, probably voted for him. I'm like, oh, you know, <laughs> oh my God, are you kidding me? And, uh, and he went on to tell that story in detail about uh, meeting for dinner um, or having a lunch with Donald Trump. And it was he was very disturbed about it. You know, obviously, very very polarizing feelings about him, and we won't talk about that either. That's that's probably not for us. But um, I, I think that that interview that that was just one of the most brilliant um, experiences for me. It was so cool to watch you interview him and the conversations that you had. And he's just such a great guy. And I'm I'm really happy that uh, I got a chance to spend that week with him. It was really cool. Yeah, that was, yeah, that 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 was. Um... That was that was great, and uh, I, I truly enjoyed. That was definitely kind of a, a high point for me, and uh, I'd like to uh, still be able to hopefully do things like that. There's just not that many people paying that much money, you know, to have those those kind of speakers there where you can do that um, that kind of mediated interview or something like that. Nobody just spends that kind of money at meetings anymore. Um, you know, I think it's part of the reason I get to speak at some of the larger meetings like Chicago Midwinter and CDA and Greater New York and, and Yankee. And they're kind of all complaining. They have the same complaint, Craig, that attendance is going down. And they really are having a hard time attracting the younger dentists to come to the meeting. Uh, is, they just don't necessarily see a ton of value in the meeting. Attending those meetings is really expensive if you're not, you know, an ADA and a CDA member if you, if you don't belong to those professional organizations. And so those meetings are trying to figure out what it is. And I always think what we were doing at Serona was kind of a, a symbol of the way that it's going to kind of need to be for live meetings. And that is if there is some entertainment along with the education, it makes it more of an event than just going to straight, you know, education. And a lot of people are afraid of that because they're like, oh, we don't want to you know, run afoul of the ADA or AGD things about having entertainment and education. But I think that's one of the directions the industry is going to need to go in if we're going to be able to do it. Like at Yankee two years ago, all we did at Yankee was we put together a day of lectures like Serona lectures and we had um, Pat the Patriot, the mascot for the New England Patriots, come out with four of the New England Patriot cheerleaders. And all they did was take pictures at lunch with the attendees who were there and they were all psyched you know, to come and take pictures with Pat the Patriot and the, and the cheerleaders. And um, something as small as that, just to make it kind of more of an event and give people a reason to kind of come to those meetings. Because I think we're seeing now that it's, um, you know, you used to go to the meetings to get your education, but there's a lot of education available online now. And, um, you know, you mentioned Glidewell. That was one of, you know, my favorite things. There's a couple of things I'm, I'm really proud of that we did at Glidewell. Um, one was creating all those videos. And we, if you still go back and watch those videos, they're about as nice as clinical videos you'll ever see. Uh, for one thing, the camera was $70,000 that we were shooting with. The, lens, wow. the, the camera was $30,000 and the lens was $40,000. And you just can't get those images with a little like head mounted camera or little HD cameras. You just can't zoom in and get that kind of clarity like we were getting with those things. And for me, I, you know, I, I am a self-proclaimed average dentist. And sometimes, you know, dentists would be like, oh, you just say that, you know, so the people will like you. I'm like, no, I wish. I wish this was all a ruse. I wish I just made this up because I thought this is my master popularity plan. You know, I was <laughs> a remedial operative in dental school. So when everybody else in dental school on the weekends was going out and doing fun stuff, I had to come attend the remedial operative, um, which was being taught by this instructor who I was in love with. I had a huge crush on her. I thought she was asking me out on a date once when she came up to me and said, hey, what are you doing this Saturday? I was like, oh, sweet. <laughs> She's attracted to me as well. 
And I said, not that I'm all yours. What'd you have in mind? And she said, oh, we're having a remedial operative clinic here. I said, oh, do you need help setting up or something? She goes, no, you're in it. I was like, I'm <laughs> in it. Oh, that's uh, discouraging. So um, I don't have a, a great set of hands. And it's just, and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, but there's, you know, tips and techniques. Um, like for me, it ended up being this reverse preparation technique that I came up with where I kind of prepped the tooth backwards from how I was taught in dental school. I start with the gingival margin and then work backwards from that. I was taught to go prep everything else and then do the gingival margin at the end. That's a really tough way to prep a great margin. And if you do it backwards and do the margin first with the round burr instead of a long tapered burr, it makes it much easier to be able to do something like that. And so share, being able to share what works for me and these below average hands to hopefully get above average results has been, um, has been fantastic. And I hear from dentists all the time about, oh, I tried that and I really like it. And that's how I prep teeth now. And um, so being at Glidewell gave me the time to try 10 to 12 different prep techniques that I found in old dental books and stuff like that. And just going through and researching and trying to find something different. And that's really hard to do in private practice. You know, you just don't get those opportunities to sit around and spend a day on a type it on trying different prep things and then trying it on some patients and seeing what, what works and, and what doesn't work. So I'm really proud of the videos we created there. I, I just looked at them the other day on YouTube. Our top, our top viewed video is from, I think 2014. So it's about five years old now. It's um, solid zirconia crowns on teeth number eight and nine, and it's got 2.9 million views. Holy which is, which is pretty amazing. I don't think there's any dental videos that have 2.9 million views. And it's, a, it's more of a testament to Glidewell's big marketing you know, pipeline and what they're able to do. But it also shows that, um, that dentists want to learn by seeing something done in the mouth, I think more than even seeing it in a magazine or maybe hearing about it live at a lecture and seeing pictures. There's something about video it can't be photoshopped. So when you see before and afters in a video, it feels more meaningful and they can actually see the process of, of how it's being done. And so, you know, sh sharing those things with Dennis has been one of the great um, rewards for me. And I, I wanna start doing those types of clinical videos again. I kind of got away from it, doing some of the other stuff like the Branson stuff and the hosting stuff. But that is the stuff that is is really good. And it doesn't have to be full mouth rehab. You know, that's just not, that, that's not my thing. I'm not, I'm not, and there's a plenty of people who do a great job teaching full mouth rehab. Frank Spear, John Coyce, you know, people who love it. It's a great way to learn how to treat the worn dentition. But at Glidewell, we tend not to work with the top 10% like a dentist. They only send cases to Glidewell if it's like an in-law who comes in for free <laughs> yeah. and they'll send it to Glidewell. And we don't really work with the bottom 10% who are sending everything, you know, offshore to laboratories. And people always think that, you know, Glidewell sends their stuff offshore. We don't send our stuff to China. The lab's in Newport Beach. Um, it's being made by pretty much all Chinese technicians. So that's, that's kind of what, you know, the difference. It's, it's, not going, it's not going anywhere. It stays in Newport Beach. And it's amazing that you can still do $99 crowns in, in, Southern, Calif in, in Southern California like that. So... Um, it's that 80% of dentists in the middle, those average dentists who I realized, oh, these are my people. You know, these are the people who, you know, finished the same kind of place I did in dental school, may or may not have been in remedial operative. But if we can master, you know, single unit crowns and get our remakes way down and just have crowns drop into place and not have to make many adjustments and, and you know, two, three unit uh, quadrants being done together at the same time, for most dentists, you know, doing a full mouth case, you know, let's say you do 24 crowns and oh, oh they all sat except I have to redo these four. That totally eats into the profit of that. Oh, case. yeah. It's much people, more don't, people don't recognize that, too. There's so much glory in these large cases. But if you think about all the preoperative, operative and postoperative time, it's it's not always the most profitable thing you can do. I think no. my dad, my dad was always, would always say the most profitable thing you can do in dentistry is a quadrant of that is a quad quadrant. Yeah literally the least amount of headaches and the highest amount of profit. Right. And yeah. So the least amount of headache, you don't have to worry about, you know, changing the smile line or a curve of speed. Vertical. Like, like, yeah. So three crowns in a quadrant. Um, and the other thing that works about three crowns in a quadrant is you can take your crown fee, multiply it by three and still do well. If you take your crown fee, multiply it by 24 with all the different temps and things you have to do for the full mouth case, it's not, 
going to work. So everybody, not everybody, but I think a lot of dentists, in, I'll speak for myself. I always thought that was the way to, you know, become a really successful dentist, whatever that means, financially, uh, professionally. It's kind of like a lot of dentists probably see you with your 18 operatories and go, oh my God, I want to be like that. But I'm sure it's the same. It's kind of, I'm sure having 18 operatories is a little bit like doing full mouth rehab, right? It is exactly. It's exactly, it's a great parallel. It's exactly the truth. I mean, in, in many ways, I have dentists telling me all the time, I want to have what you have. And I'm like, well, why? And like, well, you know, I'll make money when I'm not there. I'm like, well, tell me about your schedule. Well, I work, you know, three and a half, four days a week. I collect 1.4 million, you know, and uh, my overhead's 25%. I'm like, bro, you don't want to be me. You're living the American dream, uh, yeah, dude. You're, yeah, you're living it. He's like, yeah, but I have a job. I'm like, yeah, LeBron freaking James has a job too. Right. And it's not a bad one. So right. the idea that you have other people and there, there's somehow there's going to be a machine running when you're not there, people are messy. And the more people you put in any environment, the more complex it becomes. So it's exact great parallel to the full mouth reconstruction. All the glory, but sometimes not what drives you. And, and for me, what drives me, I guess, is the ability to have – the challenges that I have that push me to have to develop my leadership skills. And I, I wanted this. And, and when I was starting this process of building the larger office, I didn't really have the business justification to do it. It was kind of like a field of dreams approach. And um, I, I said very consciously, I said it to myself, if, if I make less money, but have this environment, where all the specialists in the lab are under one roof, would I be happier, even if I made less money? And I was unequivocally, yes. So I pursued it. But if your motivation is money, that's a really shitty motivation and money runs out and, and you'll, you'll wind up giving it everything you ever wanted and oftentimes being unfulfilled. But I digress. We should, we should standardize the numbers, though, in that story so that when you tell that story, you can talk about your practice and go, you know, having a practice with um, 18 operatories this is a lot like doing 18 crowns on a patient. You know, there's a lot to look at, a lot that can go wrong, a lot of adjustments that need to be made and, and doing it, yeah, three or four. I think that's the sweet spot. And you can put your kids through private school. You can fund your defined benefit plan. You can do everything you want to do, doing crowns two and three at a time, as long as you don't have a high remake rate. At Glidewell, um, I got really into looking at dentist remake rates. And that's something we paid a lot of attention to at Glidewell because Glidewell has a no-fault remake policy. Yes, it's uh, costly. Don't advertise that a lot, um, but but it's there. I mean, you'll never get charged for a remake, and it doesn't matter if um, it was the dentist's fault or the patient just didn't like it or whatever. Um, it gets remade for free. Now, granted, a $99 Bruxer crown, but that's not that difficult for, for Glidewell to remake. The really difficult, painful thing is the dentist having to dedicate that time to getting a patient back on Thursday, spending another 45 to 60 minutes with them you know, cleaning up, re them, getting the old yeah. freaking thing off. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the $99 crown is almost, that doesn't put out the fire at all. What should bother the dentist is having to go back in and do it themselves. So we would measure dentist remakes rates and we wouldn't even, we would break up with dentists sometimes, you know, we would say, Hey, um, we think you should see other labs uh, <laughs> out for us. We want we're, to, we're, we're seeing other dentists just so yeah. you know, we're seeing thousands of other dentists. So yeah, I feel it's, like... it's not you, it's us. Right. And, and when you go to break up with the dentist as a laboratory, they start begging for their life. They're like, no, 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 no. I'll, I'll do better preps. I'll better impressions. I won't leave my socks on the floor. I won't come <laughs> up at two in the morning drunk. I promise <laughs> this will, this will all get better. But we didn't even start thinking about firing a dentist until their remake rate got to 50%. Wow. Can you, can you believe that? Can you imagine if every hundred crowns you did, you just like your assistant would go, you think this one's going to fit? You go, hold on, take a quarter, you flip it. And you go, no, you know, because it's a 50, 50 chance whether or not this crown's going to fit. It's insane. I you, remember that story you said that you sent the wrong. I remember this now you sent the wrong, like there was someone put the wrong crown in it and they made it fit. Well, yeah, we, we, we had two dentists with the same name. One was in Washington. One was in Florida. And they both worked on a patient named Julie, different oh, people, obviously. They both did a crown number 19 on somebody named Julie. And it's a big lab. Things get messed up. The guy in Washington sees it and sees his name on the box and sees, it says Julie. And it's crown number nine, a crown on number 19. But he notices there's a wisdom tooth on the model. He pulls her x-ray. She doesn't have wisdom teeth. Calls us. Takes us a day. We figure it out. Um, we call the guy. And the guy, you know, the, the setup to the story is, 
the guy in Florida sends in, um, he never uses an impression tray. You know, he takes impressions for single unit crowns and all he uses is bite registration that he relines with a little light body material. Oh God. And, and so you see these. And so we actually- It's like an impression taco. It's like, it's a bite registration is what but it is. But there's no rigid, there's no rigid container to it. Is that no, what you're there's no tray. Yeah. He's so figured it's, it's, out that that's, that's the number one overhead hit in a dental practice yeah, is impression yeah. trays. Yeah, that, 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 one, that. that one cent per patient can right. sink you. It, it's it, not staff salaries or rent. No, it's impression yeah. trays. That's, it's that's, true. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the real big one. And so he takes bite registration, relines it. So you get an impression of the prep and you get the opposing tooth and you'll get the distal third of you know, the adjacent tooth and that's it. And so we, we, we started calling him tiny impression guy. That, that's how he was known in the lab because that's all he ever sent in. <laughs> so yeah, we, we called him about this case and his assistant was on the phone and uh, we're like, hey, we sent you the wrong case. Here's what happened. We have the right crown here. We'll send this to you. you can, can you send that one back to issue? He goes, I think so, but I think we cemented that yesterday. And we're like, no, no, tiny dental assistant. That didn't happen because it was for the wrong human being, mainly. That's why it didn't happen. And um, he said, well, let me go check and I'll call you back. And she called back and said, yeah, we cemented it yesterday. But it took doctor about 45 minutes to get it to go down. Oh, really? Did it? Yeah. They, so, um, He's, impre- he's like a reverse Sarek machine. Right. You know, Sarek, you prep the tooth and scan it, and it mills a crown that fits. This, you just send him any crown. He looks at the inside and does all these algorithms, and he mills the tooth so the crown will fit. It takes 45 yeah. minutes in the market. It's actually really remarkable he can do that. I mean, I know uh, it, and he probably, it's probably such precision fit, too. Exactly. That, re- that retro preparation uh, right. he has. And you can choose if you want the buckle cuss on the buckle or the lingual because it pretty much fits in yeah. direction. The scariest thing about him is when you go through his account, I had to go back three years to find a remake that he had. He yeah, essentially had a 0.1% remake rate. Even when it's somebody else's crown. Exactly. So that <laughs> is not our goal. When I talk about lowering our remake rate, most dentists, <laughs> Greg, I, they have no idea what their freaking remake rate is. They don't know. Yeah. If I ask them, I'll go, what's your remake rate for crown and bridge? They go, oh, I don't know, uh, maybe 2%. And you go, well, I'm just looking at what you've sent back to Glidewell. And it's 6% here. And you're probably using some other labs that have to be added in there as well. It's like asking a dentist what their case, is, uh, case acceptance percentage is. 100%. It's always 100%. Well, it's, it's in the 90s. Yeah, it's in the upper 90s. <laughs> it's in the yeah. upper 90s. Yeah. Then you actually go measure and you go, ah, it's right around 63%. But because you never really know, because if you don't measure it, you know, it's just easy to be optimistic about it. So this guy's remake rate was close to 0%. That's not what we're shooting for. There, there's 63 steps between when a dentist sends a crown into the laboratory and when it get, all these lab steps that happen and then it gets shipped back to the dentist. And then you've got the temporary crown as well, throwing every, I hate temporary crowns, but we'll get to yeah. that later. Um, it's, it's, it's crazy that you would think that you could be at 0%. So I was practicing for 15 years inside of Glidewell Labs and um, my remake percentage was between six and seven percent. It was about, it was roughly six percent. It would go up a little bit sometimes. And so for every hundred crowns that my technician Cindy gave me, 94 went in and six needed some adjustment or needed to be remade. And that's fine. There's nothing, in fact, you don't even almost remember those six if 94 of them go well. It's, but zero is not our goal. Because that just means you'll cement anything, regardless of how the margins are. You'll just, you'll put it in. As long as it goes down all the way and you can grind it up on the occlusal, you'll put it in. You won't take a bite wing to check to see if the interproximal margins are shut. So we're not shooting for that. We're shooting for six to eight or nine percent. So these dentists who have a 50, 60, 70 percent remake rate, I remember calling one of them and I said, oh, you must hate us as a laboratory. And he goes, Why? I go, because you've got a 55% remake rate here. You must hate us. He goes, no, at my last lab, I was like 65% remakes. I think you guys are amazing. You've brought me down 10%, but I'm just amazed at, I, I, I bet if you had a 50% remake rate for three months, you might hang it up. You might just say, okay, that's it. I'm going into real estate or I'm just going to do, it's just so, I can't believe they continue to come to work. And the thing I love about these 50% remake dentists is that they're absolutely honest with themselves. And even though they've been beaten down by crown and bridge and they're praying this crown will fit and they must be getting so sick of explaining to patients, sorry, we're gonna have to redo this and re-numb you and take another impression. 
even as they're being beaten down, they try the next crown on and it doesn't fit. And they're like, I, I wouldn't put this in my mouth or my wife's mouth. We're going to have to redo this. So God bless them for being having this constitutional ability to be honest with themselves and F the people with the 0% remake rates because they're the dentist you would never send your dog to. And so I began to fall in love with these higher remake dentists because regardless of how bad the case study still tell the truth. And my goal became, oh, these are the sweetest, nicest people in the world. I want to help them get their remakes down. And these people at 0%, I want to call the state board and have them show up there and see what the hell is going on. And we have picked it. We didn't do that, of course, but you, I don't even want to call a state board. I want to call Tiny Impression Guy's patients and say, hey, get the hell out of there. Run. <laughs> you want to see what's, how he's going to prep and what he's going to do to your tooth with this impression and cement a crown that doesn't fit. So I fell in love with the struggle, you know, with the people who aren't having an easy time, but they still suck it up and tell the truth to the patient that I'm not going to cement this. Well, there is some positive reinforcement to the guy that's being honest and doing the remake in that he gets to have this heart to heart conversation with the patient. Like, listen, Mrs. Jones, it doesn't fit up to my standards. I want to do and like, oh my God, doc, you're so nice. I can't believe you're going to do that. I'm going to make it all over for you. So there is some, you know, little bit of bias or reinforcement that's happening there for that, for that doctor. And also they don't work in a group setting. So they don't know what normal, what's normal. Right. Uh, you know, so, and that's the thing about dentistry too. There's, there's guys out there that have no self-awareness and they're doing really shitty work and they're busy as hell and they're making tons of money. And there's guys like that are remaking crowns for, for potentially things that are not even clinic that are clinically acceptable. Right. They have such relentless standards for themselves and not making the money they should make. It's, it's really unfortunate that there's no correlation t- sometimes between talent and success. Right. In fact, the only line that you forgot out of your conversation between the dentist and the patient about the crown not fitting was blame the lab blame the lab hard hard oh, hard yeah. always we get it we want you to blame us it's our fault um yeah we're not there we don't want you to look bad even if you're even if it was completely your fault we don't want you to look bad blame 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 the lab and, and god bless jim glidewell you know just an absolute genius in the industry sometimes the managers of the departments would get sick of these higher remake doctors they're just like oh my god if we just got rid of this you know we're making an extra eight crowns for them per month for free for this one doctor with a high remake rate which eats into their you know profitability in their department and therefore their bonus they're like can we get rid of them and jim was like nope find a way to work with them but let's find a way to help them get better um it because otherwise if we just boot them they'll go somewhere else and have the same experience and the patient's going to end up with a crappy crown if they go somewhere else so jim you know had a, a lot of ideals that he wanted to stick to and one of the ones that was difficult to swallow is no we're going to try to work with these people and it took me a while to come around to it and then i realized no these, these are the people i want to help you know I, I i don't i don't get a lot of satisfaction out of taking Craig Spodak's crowns, which on a scale from one to 10, or like an, the, your average crown in terms of quality from one to 10 is probably an 8.7, 8.9. 6.2. 6. Pretty nice crown. Yeah. Well, I don't wanna, it, it's just not that fun to take somebody at a 6.2 to an 8.5. They're like, eh, that was all right. Yeah. I wanna take the people at a 3.2 and get them up to you know a seven. And they're just doing backflips and their patients benefit and it's, yeah. It's fan. It'd be like you trying to help dentists who are at uh, five million in collections get to six and a half or seven. It, it's I don't know. For me, at least, it doesn't feel the same as, as taking somebody who's stuck at six hundred fifty thousand dollars of production and you showing them how to get to you know one and a half million, you know, or, yeah. or a little over that or whatever. So that just kind of became my path. Was I don't I'm not going to stand up and attempt to be like a clinical master because I'm just not, and I don't want to pretend and lie. Um, but I have figured out things to get above average results, hopefully with a below average set of hands. And so that's what I'm going to teach. So I love being able to interact via those kind of clinical videos or like the videos that you, you guys are doing now with your video podcast. And I guess the other thing that I'm really proud of during those years at Glidewell was um, launching Bruxer in 2009, which um, in the beginning, we weren't sure you know, how the industry was going to react to this. All, all we were doing was making a crown for second molars, where if you told somebody they should have a gold crown of the second molar and they said, I want tooth colored, 
if you put Emacs in there, it would break. You know, if it was six tenths of a millimeter thick, you didn't have room for a PFM unless it had a metal occlusal. So you finally had this ugly white thing you could stick on a second molar or a first molar to at least, you know, placate the patient when they wouldn't accept gold. And then dentists just took it and ran with it. And, and there's just this whole explosion now of brand after brand after brand of, of solid zirconia. And it's been a truly kind of transformative product because um, it doesn't require a dentist to do better dentistry for it to work well. Yeah. In fact, it can encourage poor dentistry. It fits, you know, it, it, the margins, uh, the, the tolerances of the material. It won't break under heavy occlusal forces. It'll actually oftentimes break the opposing dentition and no patient ever puts together the fact that you put a crown on the opposing dentition and broke the other arch. Like, you know, you put the crown on the upper right, my lower right broke it. Oh, the crown's really strong. And you know, like, I guess I got to do another crown. You know what they do always notice though, is when you put a crown on and the tooth starts to hurt and they, do, they always blame us for that one. And you're like, okay. And I'm always like scratching my chin. I'm like, when did it start to hurt? And they're like, uh, the second you put the crown on, I'm like, okay. Have you been in any car accidents lately? And they're like, no, what the f no. <laughs> no, I'm like, okay. Uh, do you eat a lot of cinnamon? I just start like asking random questions when they're like, no, it started hurting the second you, no, I know it seems like there's a connection there, but I, I assure you that's coincidental. You know, it's, <laughs> it is funny how sometimes, uh, yeah, they'll associate things that they shouldn't not, and not associate things that they should, but you're right, you know, um, Emacs, as great of a material as it is, and it's the almost perfect material, it does not to tolerate feather edge margins. No. And we had a lot of Emacs fractures from 2007 to 2009 at the lab, because dentists will prep a tooth and they'll have a deep chamfer on the buckle. And they'll, like I'll call dentists sometimes and I'll be looking at the prep and go, hey, what kind of margin did you do on this prep? They go, well, you're looking at it, what did I do? I go, well, yeah. You did a deep chamfer on the, so you can tell they didn't have a plan, first of all. Right, right, I right. did a deep chamfer on the buckle. You did a deep chamfer on the buckle. It turned to a, a, a regular chamfer in approximately, and then it turned into a feather edge on the lingual. So kind of what you did was like a greatest hits album. It's like a tribute <laughs> exactly. to all the margins of the world. You <laughs> demonstrated on one single tooth. You know how to do the three most popular margins, and they're all, well, you're welcome. I'm like, well, the problem is yeah. you, you prescribed an Emax crown, and we can't have a feather edge there. So we used to have to like try to bulk out the Emacs because they didn't want to reprep and it would fracture. And so once solid zirconia came along, now you had something that would, a tooth colored material that actually would work with, with feather edge margins. And dentists just are so bad at under reducing. It's just, you call any, you call the highest end labs in the country or the world and they'll still complain about under reduction. And, and so I just think it's insane. I use a depth cut base system when I prep teeth which you can't do all the time because sometimes you're replacing old crowns, so you have to find other ways to do it. But when I'm prepping a tooth that hasn't had a crown yet, I use all depth cuts and all the surfaces of the tooth. So I know exactly where I am and how much I've reduced. And this whole art of dentistry, there is an art, but the art should not be prepping teeth, you know, because this isn't a standalone sculpture, a Rodan that we're doing for people to come and look at. It's got to function with the other teeth. And so to make it art and just see the way that dentists kind of guess, like we, a friend of mine sent a crown in once, I remember, and, uh, you know, he, uh, there wasn't enough room for Bruxer. You know, Bruxer needs six tenths of a millimeter. It was on a second molar. And because we do everything digital, we can click the opposing and click the prep. And it was 0.48 millimeters between the two. And I called this friend of mine. I said, hey, you asked for a Bruxer crown, but there's less than six tenths. It's 0.48 millimeters. He said, oh, I could have swore I gave you six tenths of a millimeter. I said, how'd you measure? He goes, oh, I eyeballed it. You yeah. eyeballed a second molar, really. Yeah. So you took a mirror and you pulled the cheek back in this dark corridor where it's basically raining. It's like 100% humidity in the mouth. You closed one eye and looked back there and said, that looks like six tenths of a millimeter. How dare you? And that's the kind of, that's the art part that I think is ridiculous. I'll, I'll say this, I don't know if it's controversial, Craig, but I, if dentists were airline pilots, planes would just be falling out of the sky left and right because yeah. there'd be no checklist to see if the flaps were set, no checklist to see when to rotate the plane, no tuning. Yeah, there, there's no standardization. It's incredible. I, I work with, you know, 10 dentists in my practice and I had many come through here before and it, it's incredible. I, I remember one, I had this one guy that practiced in the neighboring town and he was so well regarded in the community. It was like, if you can get Dr. Mike over here, you know, you'd, it'd be amazing because his patients love him and he was producing a ton of money. And 
he was a nice guy and he comes in the first day and uh, well, what happened was he sold his practice, he moved away and then he came back to the area. So I was like, this is a great time to try him because it doesn't work out. I haven't like taken him away from a great opportunity. It was, he was in between opportunities. Um, and he comes in the first day and he convinced the patient to do a whole bunch of work. So that was, you know, checklist, the first thing. But then his preps were just absolutely horrible. It was, I mean, if you want to talk about art, it wasn't a Rodin, it was modern art. It was really, it was more like a Picasso. And yeah, yeah. He, he did do the margin tribute. He had every margin on the book and, and no loops. And, and I said to him, I'm like, listen, Mike, I'm not here to judge your quality of your dentistry. Obviously, you know, you, you have to practice in the way that you feel is best. But I just want to know, is this typical of what you do? He's like, oh, no, no, that was a bad day. Patient was sneezing, blah, blah, blah. And then like, I'm like, okay, because it, it kind of was disturbing how it was prepped. And sure enough, a couple of days later, it does the same type of work. And, and it just made me realize that there's highly successful guys out there that are really shitty. Um, and there's really successful guys out there. I'm sorry, there's uh, guys that are not really doing well that are really careful and consistent. And I, I just realized that, that you need this trifecta to be a good dentist. You need to have people skills because if you could be the, the best clinician in the world, but if people don't, can't build rapport with you and they don't trust you, you'll never get an up at bat. Right. And you need that diagnostic skills too. So I've had guys that are amazing at prepping teeth and they don't see anything. They don't see the periodic pathology. They don't see the, the bone loss. They, they're, they're just, they get so myopic on the tooth and not the mouth. They don't see the forest of the trees. And then the third, of course, is the hand skills, which we're, we're speaking about. But if you don't have one of those things, you're not going to be able to do a good job and, and it's not going to lead to fulfillment. And dentists are really not good at being aware of what's their deficiency. So, I mean, to, to your point that the 50% remake guys are hyper aware, they're, they're aware that this is not as, as, as good as it should be. So I, I could see. Well, what I, yeah. So, but I don't know. The 50% remake dentist might think that all dentists have a 50% remake rate. And so that's, that's where I'm not sure. And there's been some group practices that have had me come in and work with their doctors. And it's, it's a really kind of unmet need right now. Like, now, if you're huge like a Pacific Dental that's, or a Heartland, that's a little different. But there's a lot of smaller groups that have five, six, seven practices. They're still hiring recent graduates. It's a little terrifying to me. I don't know about your dental school experience, but to graduate the University of the Pacific when I did back in 1988, we had to have done 25 crowns. That was like the minimum to graduate and it could go up from there. Um, I talked to a graduate from the University of Pittsburgh um, last year who had done six crowns prior to graduation. And so I asked another question. I asked about endo. I said, how many endo procedures did you do? And he said, three. I said, God, that's not, that's not very many to go out into practice. He said, I know, I really wish I would have got the chance to do a molar. I said, you graduated from a U.S. dental school and you didn't do a molar endo? And he said, well, I got to do one on an extracted tube. Yeah. Said, well, as it turns out, it's way more difficult when it's still in the yeah. ophelis attached yeah. to the patient's skull. It's a lot easier when you watch the file come out the apex and then watch the gut <laughs> come out and back it off a little. That, that brings the degree of difficulty down. And so the group practices are hiring a lot of recent graduates who have very low clinical confidence because they just haven't done very many of these procedures. And I get real passionate about teaching them this in your, your triangle of the three things you need to be a successful dentist. I like focusing on the hands, the skills one, because I'm living proof that you don't need it. So that excuse is out the window. I'll show you how to prep if your hands suck and it'll work because it's, it's paint by number. It's prep by numbers, basically. You know, most of us can't paint, but any of us can do paint by numbers. And, and so what I teach is, is prep by numbers, where it's literally kind of a system. I've wanted to make patient bibs for these doctors, where it just lists all the steps right here. You can check facing it off. Facing the wrong chart. way. Yeah, 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 facing the wrong way. Like on the back of an ambulance, like when you look at an ambulance in the rear view mirror. Yeah. People are like, oh, I don't know if that'll inspire confidence in the patients. I go, oh, it will. Just like it inspires you that the pilots on the airplane you're on are using checklists and they're not just going from rote memory or trying to be artistic like we are with our, with our preps. And so I think that's a lot easier to teach someone how to be able to do if they weren't born with hand skills than trying to teach the people skills. I don't know if that, is that one of the things that you teach while you're out there is the people skills? Yeah. I mean, I try to improve. Uh, listen, we're all learning and I'm, I learn from my docs and we all learn from each other. But, but that is, you know, one of the biggest challenges is, is the people skills. 
and I think it, it really, when a dentist gets back into a corner and they're being challenged or they're getting questions, they go very clinical and patients glaze over. They start right. using you know, bone and cutting and alveolus and bimax protrusion, excursive movements and patients are like, holy shit, what the hell are you saying? So, you know, I think just, just putting into patient centric language and what's the benefit to them. Um, but, but those are the challenging ones. I would rather have um, clinical deficiencies if I had a doctor with, you know, that needed some clinical remedial training versus the, the character and personality training is hard stuff. Right. I, I, if, I agree. If possible at all. If right. Possible at all. Yeah, because I can teach kind of a prep by numbers and, pe and if people follow it, it works. And I know it works because I get invited to go to the Loma Linda Dental School every year and give a lecture to the third year students. And they've, at that point, have only prepped a couple of teeth. And so I show them this video. And if anybody wants to see this video, just go on, you go to Glidewell's uh, YouTube channel. It's called the Ver Reverse Preparation Technique or just Google Reverse Preparation Technique. We'll put it in our show notes. The reverse, no, no. We'll put that in the show notes. And um, so we teach it to these th third year students. I show it to them once on a video and talk about it. We give them a burr kit and, you know, these hundred students go back and do it on their typodonts and bring it up to me to grade. And I'm just like, oh my God, these third year preps on typodonts look better than most of the stuff that comes through Glidewell. And it's because they don't, they just follow the technique. They're like, okay, well, they taught us one other. And they let, and the school is nice enough to let me stand up in front of them. So all the students are there and then the instructors in their back. And I point to them, I go, they're teaching you the wrong way to prep teeth. I mean, it's fine for the top 10% of you. In fact, top 10%, go ahead and raise your hands. You know, no one ever does. And I go, cool. And one guy, well, and I go, can we all agree he's in the top 10? They're like, yeah, he's pretty good. I go, well, we <laughs> can teach him how to prep teeth with a handpiece duct taped to his foot. You know, he's got that much talent. I'm talking about for the rest of you, we're teaching a technique that where anything works for the top 10%, but you're being taught the wrong way to do it. I'm going to teach you a different way today. And it's mind blowing to me that a school will let somebody come in and say that. I mean, I do it in a humorous way where I'm not like, you know, railing at them, at the instructors, but um, you see some great results um, come from it. And so that's, to me, that's much easier than teaching like um, personality by numbers. And I know Paul Homily, you know, I, I love his stuff. He, he does a good job with uh, that too, but I do think that's more difficult. I would rather have, you know, I know dentists who put up big numbers in terms of crown of bridge and just overall productivity. And I wouldn't go see them. I've seen their preps and impressions. So those two things really have nothing, nothing to do with each other as, as you kind of mentioned. So I would much rather have that kind of dentist who is confident, um, who talks to people in plain English where they tell them they need this bridge and this implant and these two crowns and these three fillings and a crown over there. And they're like, okay, that makes sense. Let's let, let's do it, and um, and and get that dentist clinically better. Maybe it's because that's all I know how to do is is get them clinically better. But I agree with you, and I remember having a, a conversation with. Um, are you familiar with Pacific Dental? Do you know those guys? Yeah, yeah of course. So they're up to whatever six hundred and sixty offices now, and Steve Thorne's the CEO, and um, he told me once that they really struggle to find uh, associates that they hire who will, who are able to treatment plan a crown and a half worth of production per day, and then perform a crown and a half worth of production per day. So if a crown's a thousand dollars, they're, they can't, they have a really hard time finding somebody who can treatment plan 1500 a day and produce 1500 a day. And wow. anybody who's been in practice for 20 years, like what? That'd be the most disappointing day uh, that I'd ever had. Um, but it's kind of that low clinical confidence that they have and their ability to do these procedures and have them work that I think is, is part of the problem. But they also get students from dental schools who just get it and for whatever reason can communicate and they are confident and, and they just start to flourish as soon as they get in practice. Um, and there, I asked Steve, is there any way to identify these students when they're dental students as seniors? He goes, not that I've ever seen. I said, what would it be worth to you if I could figure out how to identify those two or three racehorses, you know, from every dental class. He said, uh, I'd pay you 25 million, just as a start. Oh I'd give you $25 million. If you found a way, whether, you know, something they could do, whether it was a written test or a hands-on or a combination where you could identify the studs who are going to be able to come out and do that because they're hiring, like most of the DSOs are, a lot of recent graduates and they've got 30, 40% turnover 
every year because these new grads just aren't able to cut it. You know, you and I got out of school and most of us went into a private practice where you bought a practice and took a loan or whatever, and you had to diagnose and produce that much just to make the numbers kind of work. So I'm kind of glad the DSOs are around because we have, we have dental students graduating now who um, they're not quite fully formed, like in terms of the clinical experience we had. And I think we had less clinical experience than the generation before. Oh, for sure well. we did. Yeah, I'm a third uh, generation. Yeah, my yeah. dad was doing crazy stuff. Right. They were phasing out. I did like a gold foil and some stuff. but we I saw a video on a gold foil. We didn't even use a gold foil. We didn't even get to mix a zinc phosphate cement. We, oh, we did. That's interesting because I graduated 10 years after you. But right. um, yeah, we, we had to stack her. We had to do our own lab work at Tufts. So not only did I have to prep the crowns, I think I might have graduated doing like 80 crowns or 100 crowns, but I had to make the crowns, cast the metal, put the porcelain on. And nothing teaches you to be a better um, dentist, a, a more a, an appropriate reducing dentist than stacking that porcelain. When yes. You're like, oh, shit, so, I'm out of room. So now you're on to my next, my next thing that I've been trying to talk the ADA into, which is as part of the dental degree that after you graduate while you're waiting for board results, um, you have to spend four months working in a dental laboratory. Uh, that'd be amazing. And you've got to start making some crowns. We hired several dentists over the years at Glide World to help with projects we were doing. And the only dentist we ever hired who didn't reduce, who didn't under reduce had been a ceramist for 14 years at the lab before she went to dental school and then came back. And, yeah. and that's the thing at UOP, we made uh, one or two gold crowns. We were never allowed to touch porcelain. It's one of the reasons why CEREC doctors or chairside CAD CAM doctors are kind of the best preppers and the best oh, yeah. impression takers out there. And it's like, oh yeah, sure they are. How do you, it's like, no, when you're forced to be your own lab tech and deal with your own mess, you learn pretty quickly. You don't want these $35 Emacs blocks chipping because you under prep the margin. You learn very quickly. Well, also, how to do that, how to make it you're, work. you're evaluating your prep with two and a half or four times magnification. You put it up on the freaking screen under 30. You're like, right. oh, shit, was I like, it looks like you were, you did it like with, uh, with beaver teeth. It's like yeah. you see all those undulations of your margin. I mean, Sarac and, and, um, scanning technology and seeing your your uh tooth occupy a full 16 inch monitor screen is is humbling yeah i mean if you look at a flower neuro microscope it's got a lot of nuances to it as well but yeah, I, when, I, when i started doing digital impressions i was so embarrassed that i would turn the screen away from my assistant she goes, yeah can mark I the mar I mark the margin make everything magic <laughs> she goes yeah. can i see i go no i'm not done yet hold on i do some more do some more scan it again okay now you can look and, yeah and, and I do think that's one of, and that's the thing, you know, we used to just be able to prep teeth without depth cuts and then send it to the lab and the lab would pour it up and look at it and go, oh, it doesn't look like there's enough room. And the dentist would be like, I'm pretty sure there's enough room. The lab's like, I'm not sure. Just make it work. And the dentist says, yeah, I'm the one, I'm the one paying the check. So I think there's enough room. Uh, that all changed when we went digital and all the labs have gone digital way before dentists have done it so now we take a polyvinyl impression that gets sent to the lab we pour up both sides put it on our articulator and the next thing we do is separate it scan them both in one of our three shaped desktop scanners put it together scan them like that and you go to design the crown and click click you can see exactly how much reduction has been done to a hundredth of a millimeter and now when the dentist says i'm pretty sure i gave you a millimeter you can send him a screenshot that shows us 0 0.74 0 0.74 millimeters and there's no more he said, she said. It's like game over, dude. So the labs have stepped up their game to be able to precisely measure how much we produce. It's time that we as dentists step up our game and start using depth cuts so we don't look like idiots by under-reducing preps. Because there's no more argument. They can see exactly how much we under-reduced. Yeah. I mean, and if you think about it, it's not really about you. It's about your patient. Right. And if you're doing, you, you got to be aware enough to know when you need improvement. Um, that's what's, that's what I love about, you know, a group practice environment and, you know, the DSOs or what I've got over here with a bunch of doctors, we all learn from each other. And one of these guys that we have, he's just, he's a maverick at preps. He's like the, he's, he's amazing at his preparations and he's actually doing a course for us. Mm -hmm, cool. Yeah, he, he's going to do a little, um, in office course. So I just want to digress just for a second and, uh, and, and go back to your journey because you know we, we kind of jumped right in with with you at uh glidewell but how many years did you actually practice dentistry before you got to glidewell i was uh like 13 years in private practice and then um one of uh 
the Glidewell, the managers from the Crown and Bridge Department, um, started coming, he and his family, as patients. And it was right when they were starting to work with CapTech. I don't know if you're- Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, Cap yeah. I know CapTech well. That was yeah. like in the late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah. I loved it. That was. That was the late 90s. And um, he started saying, um, you know, we'd love to do some, you know, it was a more expensive crown because it was a 22 karat gold coping. But it was and warm. It, it was warm. It was the color of Denton. Well, it did. It looked way better than a PFM with For a sure. non-precious coping. I mean, there's For no sure. doubt about that. I mean, it wasn't, I don't think it could be mistaken for a natural tooth per se, not look, not compared to like Emacs or, or, or Brux or Aesthetic, but compared to an old gray PFM, it looked better than that. And he was like, boy, we'd really love if you could come by one day and do some crowns on our employees. We'd love to take pictures and take videos of it. Is that something you'd ever do like on a Friday when you're not lecturing? I'm like, uh, yeah, sure. Do you have an opportunity? He said, yeah, we just finished building it. You can come over and look at it. So um, I went over there and looked at it and um, they had selected a couple patients from this guy's d department and we did some cap tech crowns and it was, it was kind of fun and there was a bunch of technicians in the room. And that's what really turned things around for me. Uh, I realized that sitting, sitting, I didn't realize this when I was in private practice, but for me, and this is obviously not true for uh, most dentists, but sitting there alone with the patient and my assistant who's heard all my stupid stories and jokes already <laughs> um, and working on this one lady, this housewife from Newport Beach, who may or may not, you know, like the crown and may or may not be complaining about the injection and stuff like that. Um, and it's before DSOs and group practices. I mean, solo practice was the great dream for most of us coming out of school, but solo practice is kind of super lonely. You know, I mean, it, it, in a sense, it's kind of like, uh, it's lonely is that there's not other dentists and you don't get to talk about their endo techniques or see their impressions. And all of a sudden, when I got to, when I got to practice or start working on patients, and it was the patient was a technician and there was 15 other technicians in the room who had never seen dentistry done before. And I'm talking the whole time explaining what I'm doing and they're ooing and aahing because they've never seen dentistry done before. I was like, Oh, I like this. I like dentistry as performance, you know, whether it's videotaping it and voicing it over or whether it's having, it could have been other dentists around the room, but this was even kind of a lower bar to me because it was technicians who had never seen dentistry done before. So they were more impressed than had the room been full of dentists. And that really spoke to me. This was, dentistry got fun now because now I was joking around with the room of technicians and showing them things and they were teaching me things uh, and they could make requests if they wanted more reduced on the preps. And tech, when you work on dental technicians as patients, they're the only patients who will get angry at you if you under reduce, they will, insist grind more on the occlusal of this tooth you're like really they're like yes please i need room. they're making their own crown they want to make it beautiful take more off of there they're the only people who like beg for more reduction they just yeah. want to like, see a truck be able to go through so after those 13 years in private practice i remember being at a glidewell christmas party and jim said are you enjoying this coming over and doing the videos i said i love it it's it's awesome i said it's so much more fun for me than regular practice. He said, well, what would it take to have you come over and do it full time? I was like, well, I'd have to sell my practice and I guess make this much money. And he goes, done. And I'm like, oh, damn, that was an awful negotiation. <laughs> I didn't realize at the time how much money the lab had. Oh, I, wasn't yeah. around, I wasn't around there full time yet and I hadn't seen the two jets or the two yachts yet. So I was like, damn. Exactly. You're um, cheaper than like one hour of gas exactly. on my jet, Dr. Vitola. But it ended up being amazing because um it allowed me to do this performance dentistry you know in front of technicians all the yeah, time and you're so and have good fun at it with them. Too, man you're so good at it it allowed me to do things like um like we would have crown shootouts all the time where we would prep like eight and nine crowns on eight and nine on a patient and the emax department would bring three sets of crowns the pfm department would bring two um whatever else we did at the time but the pro Sarah department would bring some and I'd label them all and I wouldn't tell anybody which ones were which. And then we'd try them all in and everybody would vote. And then we'd reveal what it was. And we'd be taking pictures and filming it the whole time. So we would get to order, you know, seven or eight sets of crowns at a time, which was, it was super fun. And it, it was just this great back and forth. And then when we started bidding on it and voicing them over, um, I really enjoyed all of that. So it's kind of a non-traditional dental practice position, but I really, it'd be like you, uh, doing crowns and if you had four new dentists and they were coming in they were watching and you had a patient who was cool with you ex explaining yeah. what you were doing and showing them it's a, for me it just fit 
I had no idea it would fit into my personality like that, but it was kind of the per perfect thing for me to be able to, to do that um, and have it be performing at the same time. Yeah, I mean, in the same way, like my dad, I practiced with my father. Uh, when I took over the practice uh, back in 2006, he's like, why don't you pay me X percentage of what I do? Because, you know, I'm only going to work for three or four more years, maybe five. And if you pay me this percentage, you'll effectively have bought the practice because he was like, it was a really high percentage. It was like 75% of what he does. Mm -hmm. It's like, that, that, that sounds good. Lo and behold, uh, 13 years later, he's still practicing. Is he <laughs> and, really? Uh, yeah, so he's 77, knock on wood, he's still practicing. Oh but my God, that's amazing. For the same reason that you just described. He gets to interact with a whole bunch of dentists, he mentors them, and it's, it's just a different level. To your point, like impressing a patient and having a patient give you feedback is one level of fulfillment, but actually transforming a dentist and who in turns then, and we talked about this before we hit record, who uh, transforming a dentist or helping a dentist who then in turn serves as community is a vicarious fulfillment that is, is, is truly beautiful. And I think one of the reasons why Pete and I do this, and I, I know an, enough about you to know that's what drives you as well. So, so jumping forward now, are you, you, you're mentioning this live patient thing that you're doing. So you're coming back fully around to this education thing that you're going you're gonna to be doing this again. Yeah, let me let me put well, let me add one last thing to to just touch on something we said before. As as valuable as we think it would be for a dentist after dental school to spend four months in a lab making crowns, and as silly as it sounds, that at my school we made two gold crowns and never touched porcelain and never did that. To me, it's just as crazy that the vast majority of laboratory technicians are sit and work on stone models all day and have never seen dentistry done before. You know, when they get the opportunity to see a fellow technician gagging on an impression or, you know, I just, when, when we have to like re-impress somebody, I'd really play it up. You know, I was like, um, if I had to re-inject with anesthetic, I was like doing all the stuff you see on a medical TV yeah. show. So I'm like squirting some out and tapping it. Like I'm going to do, yeah, exactly. And doing it in front of them and then going in to do this. It's and a practice job. <laughs> yeah, so it was a... Uh, it was like high drama for the technicians to watch this because I wanted them to get that if, if, if they cut a corner and it's our fault that a crown has to be remade, this is what the dentist and the patient have to go through. And um, it's so funny how the room gets, everybody could be chattering and as soon as you pick up that needle, get ready to go, it's deathly, deathly quiet. You know, everybody just stops talking. It's like some holy ritual of human sacrifice is going to take place or, or something like that. So, um, it's crazy that they are making crowns for a living. They've never actually seen yeah, that disconnect is crazy. That's yeah. what kind of drove me in the practice to have the lab on site. You know, I've worked with a buddy of mine who practiced in Germany, uh, my buddy, Peter Tain. And uh, in Europe, it's very common that technicians and dentists are together. Right. And it just makes so much more sense. I know it's not practical for everyone, but it's a beautiful environment because the subtleties of, I mean, even just for the patient experience itself, you know, I, I remember uh, one of my doctors, Dr. Alfredo, uh, there was a guy who had a single unit crown. It broke. Um, he had had it for 10 years, but he recalled that when he had it made, it took him seven trips to the lab to have it made. Uh -huh. And we were able to do it in one single visit, albeit a long visit. Right. Um, we were able to do it uh, as a single visit. And that, that's just so much more fun. And I do believe that, you know, technologies like CEREC and you know, E4D and whatever else they have out there now, that bridges the gap in a more practical sense where the dentist can play technician and, and have that level of communication, which is cool. It's too bad that most dentists don't want to play technician. In fact, if all those companies wanted to have their sales go up 200%, all you have to do is sell your system with a lab technician duct tape to the side of it. Yeah. Now, I know this is human trafficking and possibly slavery, right. but if just sell human beings. If you could just duct tape it. Yeah, I'm sure in certain in certain areas that Sarek has sold, it's it's a feasible business concept. Not yeah. not so so much in the United States, but in other areas. Yeah, it's a, it'd be amazing if you bought a Sarek system that came with an employee who was right. going to design the crown and stain and glaze it in the office. Every dentist would go, well, yes, of course, this is what I want is to not have to be a lab tech or I would have gone to lab school. So yeah, to answer your other question. Um, Really what I want to do is, is produce, I've been working with Aegis Publications. They, okay. uh, they own Inside Dentistry, Inside Dental Technology, and, and Compendium. So they've got the, you know, three of the biggest magazines in, in dentistry. And they feel that video is their future. You know, it's, it's the present, obviously. We've been doing it at Glidewell, so it's clearly the present. But um, 
they want to build a, a platform and be able to do more meaningful things. So I'm, I'm helping them kind of design this platform and figuring out what we're going to do. So I want to be able to do something like I was doing at Glidewell, but that's all kind of, when I was doing that at Glidewell, it's, it's my opinion. It's my techniques that I like to teach and things like that. Uh, what I've been working on is trying to figure out how to make it mobile so I can come to your practice and, um, and actually come in for a day or, or two days, two weeks apart and do that same type of thing um, with a KOL like yourself and showing something that you love talking about or whoever might, whoever That's it might so be. That's so cool. And so, it's so much more dynamic because you're changing environments and changing guests and that's really cool. I love that. Yeah, effect. and so it would have a little bit of, um, it would hopefully have a little bit of all three parts of your of your triangle in it. Uh, but I'm just a huge believer in in clinical video as being about the best way to learn if you're not going to do like a, a lot, go to a live patient course or something like that. And and we saw at Glidewell, you know, even back in say 2013. Um, Sixty-two, sixty-three percent of the content was being viewed on mobile devices, and so that's only gone up since then. I was at a restaurant uh, yesterday, and um, Open Table. Have you ever used Open Table for us? Yep. They had just done a um, a software upgrade and sent it out to all the restaurants, and so it, it it wasn't working that well. And I was there the next day, so our reservation had like slipped down, and the guy was super apologetic. He said, "Sorry, we're getting it figured out today." Open Table pushed this update out to us. And I said, what percent of your reservations come through uh, open table these days? He said, it's right around 65%. It's like, oh my God, 65%. He said, yeah, we send them about $9,000, you know, in fees every month for those people who do it. So I said, what was it five years ago? Five years ago, he goes, oh, like 2%. We get like a few kind of here or there. And so it's just become this, this new reality for them. And I feel the same way about the, the mobile devices is that we, we need to, there's nothing wrong with the magazines. You and I grew up with nothing but dental magazines and we read them and we saw the images. But I agree with Aegis that when you can see movement and see dentistry being done, it's being done live and it's, it's not just, you know, pictures and reading words that it draws viewers in, especially if it's done oh, of course. over that's interesting. And so we, we want to create kind of a Netflix for dentistry almost where there's going to be different channels you can watch, the restorative channel, the implant channel the Perio channel um, and all these different channels where there'll be programs underneath it. And so that's what we want to start creating. Yeah. That's going to be amazing actually. And funny enough, Netflix is in dentistry that that movie got a couple of, uh, you know, tens of millions of views. You know, they took that completely off the, uh, of, of Netflix. They scrubbed all the content and erased all traces of it. You aware of that? No, I didn't yes. realize that. Yes. Yeah, so um, about a week ago, so the movie came out in January. We're talking about the root cause movie saying right. that the root canals cause all sorts of ungodly medical conditions. Um, but Netflix took it off and um, they scrubbed their website and there's no mention of it any longer. Um, you know, it's funny. Um, when I went to, I don't know what it, what it was like when you went to school because you were 10 years after me. But when I went in 1988, um, maxillary molars only had three canals. Yeah, that's and, true. Uh, you know, so I learned a few years ago that there's this fourth canal. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, uh, why would human beings in just 20 years, how would evolution create yeah. like a fourth, a me, an MB2 canal? It just doesn't even make sense with the evolution. Yeah, that, I think that happened with giraffes in one single generation yeah. as well. They had like six exactly. inch necks and they went six feet, like boom. Exactly. And all of a sudden there's a fourth, there's probably going to be a fifth canal by the time yeah, our kids there will be. in dental school. And then you look at the 3D anatomy of what we're trying to shape and clean. Uh -huh and sterilize, and I've kind of come to the conclusion that um, that endo exists because implants hadn't been invented yet. Oh, I don't know about that. I think- <laughs> You don't know about that? Well, I, I, I think that- I just like to say controversial things. Sometimes. No, I know, but you know, that's, that's a fairly, no, I, I hear you. I mean, listen, the average root canal done by the average guy is probably not that pretty, but when it's done properly under a microscope and um, it tends to, I, I, well, here's what I'm saying. If the Branamark root form implant had been invented in 1940, yeah, and, and endo hadn't been invented yet, and then endo came out in 1990, do you think it would have caught on for yeah. for say? Okay, that, that's yeah, what I, that's, I, I agree. I agree with that's that. all I meant by that. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I actually look up to guys like you know Steve Buchanan was one of my instructors and. 
Cliff Ruddle. I mean, those, those, it, those guys are amazing and insane and, and what they do. And that, that's a tolerance beyond any and a concentration beyond any kind of crown of rep thing. I have a ton of respect for Ed Adonis. I, ju I just yeah. think it's amazing. Yeah, I think, um, you know, a lot of people are pinging me and asking me questions of how to field, que uh, how to field the controversy. And unfortunately, it hit close to home because I have some high profile patients who that they saw that movie and they were just adamant root canals that they've had in their mouths for 15 years before they met me. They're flying around to different, you know, holistic specialists and having those teeth taken out, which is really disturbing to me. But, um, you know, there, there's two types of evidence. There's correlated, correlated, correlated evidence and causative but you know the the movie says what that ninety seven percent of people who have had uh, who have cancer have had a previous root canal. It's like you know ninety seven percent of people <laughs> who have cancer have eaten pizza and ridden right. in a, or worn a cotton shirt. So uh, I'm thankful that that uh, that that movie's off the. Off you know that. what? I I just assumed it was going to be up, and I didn't make a. I've been traveling a lot for with Chicago Midwinter and a bunch of other stuff, and uh, I haven't seen it yet. I, yeah. just, I I didn't know it was going anywhere, and so I didn't wasn't in a hurry to see it. So I'm kind of bummed it's gone. Maybe yeah, I mean, YouTube store or something. Yeah, no, I'm sure. I think it's still an Apple video. You, you'll still okay. be able to find it, you know, unfortunately. But um, the ADA made a statement against it and put some pressure on Netflix, which I thought was uh, good. And Netflix is trying to, you know, be a more credible documentary uh, film studio. So they don't want so anything you, like you that. Guys do, um, you guys do removable aligners like Invisalign in your practice? Yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a diamond provider and Invisalign, soon to be Invisalign faculty. So I do a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Oh, wow. You, um, yeah, you saw the news yesterday, right? Well, I saw the news yesterday, but that's, I mean, that's kind of a little esoteric, but I'm just wondering in kind of a bigger picture thing, what you think of Smile Direct Club and how many uh, of your patients are mentioning it to you? So, uh, so uh, there's a little bit of um, bias there because people don't come to me uh, to report that they've had a good experience with Smile Direct Club, you know, so I'm sure there's tons of people that are having Smile Direct Club and they're happy with the results. They're just not coming to me to talk to me about it. But what I am finding is anybody who's not happy with it. So there's, you know, the information that I get is biased. It's not, it's not true reporting. I, I, I've had a couple of patients who um, have had it done and they, things have gone awry, but maybe there's thousands of people that are having it done and it's going great. Um, you think so? I, my, my personal belief is that, um, well, let me issue this challenge to you then, Craig, yeah. um, for the next three months, try doing all of your Invisalign cases without IPR or attachments okay? or without, without x-rays or seeing if they have implants or, or bridges. Well, I mean, that, not, I don't even care about that. Just try moving teeth with aligners without <laughs> composite attachments or IPR and tell me how it goes. Because it doesn't work without those. I mean, you can do, you know, something like six month smiles. You can put brackets and arch wires in, but aligners without attachments and IPR, that's going to treat like 5% of cases, maybe. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I, I know that um, Smile Direct Club's legal department is fairly robust. And I think that after what they were able to accomplish with Invisalign, I'm not going to comment about their, their viability in the, in the market. I just know that um, it's, you know, all I, my practice, my, per, my personal practice is entirely dedicated to Invisalign. It's all I do. Right. Um, so, uh, and I find it incredibly difficult, um, you know, rewarding, but difficult. I have to spend a lot of time on case design and, you know, making sure that I don't get attachment loss and making sure that, you know, I don't get bone loss and to, to have a company that can completely do it autonomously without any um, supervision of a dentist is remarkable to me. And also furthermore remarkable, I'm just really surprised that our, you know, ADA and the governing org organizations that support us are not interested in what they're doing. They're seemingly under. Well, they the are. No, there's like 36 lawsuits from different states. So and I just said smile direct club, but there's six other ones now. And yeah. There's yeah. There's a whole six bunch. More, six more by summer. So that's interesting to hear you say that about it's rewarding, but difficult. So let me ask you this then. In terms of degree of difficulty on a scale from one to 10, one being the easiest, 10 being the hardest rate for me, um, the average Invisalign case in terms of degree of difficulty against the average maybe veneer case, I'd be interested. Oh my God, inordinate. I mean, no, I can't even rate that. What I meant by difficult is I spend a lot of time on it. I don't just send my stuff out to clean check and accept what comes back. I design the cases, but I mean, I love you know, my clinical Invisalign days, I'll see 45 patients, uh, but I come home and I'm feeling, you know, rewarded and fresh and I'm not exhausted, but you sit me down to do a 
10 unit or 12 unit veneer case, oh my God, I'm wiped out. So no, right. not even, not even close, you know, in comparison, but I've also been doing Invisalign for 15 years, I have more than a thousand cases under my belt. So it just becomes part of like, you know, my daily routine. I, I love it. I get happy patients and also patient management is really important too. So the first question I walk in when I'm doing a liner check is I look them dead in the eye. I'm like, are you getting 21 hours in your Invisalign? Say, well, kind of, yeah, I'm doing good. I'm doing real good. I'm like, well, what does good mean? That's 21 hours? Like, no, 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 I'm wearing it every night. I'm like, so the daytime now? I'm like, your teeth are going to be totally jacked. You're going to wind up really upset at me and I just want to shift the burden. So I have these ways of dealing with the patients because if you don't manage it correctly and you don't tell the patients what to expect and their responsibility, it's not going to work and you shift the blame to them. Right. If you did a 10 unit veneer case and they never show up at the dentist again and five years later they all break because they have caries, it's your fault. Somehow it's still your fault. So I, I think what I love about, you know, orthodontics is that as long as you're up front and tell them what they have to do to maintain it, they have to wear the retainers. They come back in five years and be like, oh, doc, you're going to kill me. I'm like, well, what's wrong? I didn't wear my retainers. My teeth moved. I guess I have to do it over again. So there's this, there's this transfer. Oh, response. yeah, I'm really upset. I'm really emotionally yeah. attached to this outcome. Yeah. I'll take yeah. another $3,000 from you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, my God. No, you're crushing me. I, I'm suicidal. Yeah. Yeah, right. it's funny that they you do. know what I'm saying? Like in yeah. dentistry, whenever it's, it's, we do this interesting thing in dentistry that it's like dentist and disease together on one side and patients like medical in the medical world is like, Diane, you have cancer. Um, I'm your oncologist. We're going to do everything we can in our power to beat this thing. But you know, cancer is very serious. And so it's like you stand on one side in the medical world and the patient and disease, they own the patient, the patient owns the disease. Dentists do something very quirky, and I hope I'm expressing this correctly, but it's like, Diane, you have TMJ. I'm going to fix your TMJ. I'm going to eradicate, you know, you have decay. I'm going to fix your decay. Never mind the fact that the reason why you have decay is because you eat Twinkies at two in the morning, you don't brush your teeth. But we actually assume the responsibility of the disease. I think that's why a lot of our uh, colleagues are so unhappy because sometimes you can't help people if they don't help themselves. And I'm very careful with that. When people come in needing a full mouth rehab, we've got to look at the behavior that got them to the full mouth rehab. Right. They don't own a toothbrush. Right. And the more dentistry you have, the more prevention is required. It's not somehow magically you put a bunch of crowns on everything. The need for dentistry goes away. Right. So The need for prevention goes away. Yeah. I mean, it gets, the burden goes up. It's always it like my up. analogy about digital, digital impressions as well. Um, there's a lot of great things you can do. You mentioned blowing things up 30 times uh, with some desktop sharing software. You can have your technician look at your preps and say, do you need me to prep more? You can check how much reduction you've actually done uh, on the tooth itself. Uh, there's so many great things that digital impression systems do. The one thing they're not that good at is actually taking the impression, you know, because you have to take better care of the tissue. You have to have better isolation, better moisture control, um, you really should, they have to be pretty much equigingival or just slightly subgingival if you get enough horizontal retraction, but you have to be a better dentist to get the same results with digital impressions that you could get with polyvinyl or, yeah. or polyether. And so it's digital, it should be like solid zirconia. Digital impression should be the other way where you don't have to pay as much attention. Right. It's the exact tissue. opposite. You can still get better results. And we haven't yeah. seen that technology yet. And that's why the growth of standalone DI units is kind of, it's growing a little bit. Uh, Align's the only company having success with it because they're tying it into their services. But digital impression units aren't going to blow up until they make it easier to take it. Right. Impression. Yeah, you do it. You do a you do an average crown with a knife edge margin. Take an impression and have it sent to the lab. You're going to get a, a good result. You do an average crown and scan it digitally and make a, a digital crown. You're going to get a shitty result. Right. So, so the technology is actually making it harder for us. But you know, if you're willing to do the work and make it exceptional, it'll be more convenient, better for the patient. Can I and tell you? Free. Can I tell you my favorite dental quote? Please. It's from uh, Dr. Bill Strupp. In, uh, oh, cool. in Clearwater, got, Florida. I love his, uh, I love his strupisms. Oh yeah. He, he's just, he's so black and white. And, and I mean, this quote is really black and white too. And that's why I kind of amend it after I say it. But um, I mean, I just saw this once and I was like, holy, sh I wish I would have sat, I wish I would have sat around and thought of this because this, this <laughs> kind of quote would be right in my wheelhouse, but somehow I, I don't know how this occurred to him, but uh, I saw it at one of his lectures and I just scribbled it down as fast as I could. 
Oh, no, he said it in an interview. I was interviewing him for Chairside Magazine. He actually said it. The quote is, um, a crown and bridge impression is merely a reflection of the dentist's integrity. Nothing more and nothing less. And it's like, damn, that's, yeah. uh, it's like, hey, you want to uh, you wanna measure up your integrity as a dentist? Show me a crown and bridge impression. Because no one's going to see that besides you in the lab. The patient's yeah. never going to see it. Yeah. Integrity is what you do when nobody's looking is a quote yeah. that I've heard before. And so awesome. it's a little too strict though, because it could have been a patient who could only open this much and was gagging. So I would say, show me um, 10 crown and bridge impressions for many dentists and it's a measure of their integrity. And that's why I always think that the easiest way to judge who are the best dentists in your community is call your local lab owner Oh yeah, for and say, sure. And say, if you broke a tooth tomorrow, who would you go to? And then, without even thinking, they'll rattle off two or three names, and you'll say, "Why? Are they the closest to your office? No. Are they the cheapest? No. Why? The, the best preps and impressions. I see them come in here all all day long, and they do the best. And so, the labs know. The labs always know, and the and the lab guys know who is who is doing it right. And, and that's why I think any dentist who has the opportunity, just go by your lab one day and walk through there. Look at what other people are doing. Look at what kind of impression material they're using. Look at the trays. Look at what kind of cases they're doing. See see what the models look like once they're poured. Um, talk to your technician. What, what's his, his or her favorite way to polish zirconia, polish lithium disilicate. Just go hang out with them and, if, and start taking pictures. I mean, at Glidewell, it was heartbreaking when we would get a uh, an RX and an impression from like a dentist in you know Pittsburgh, and it's a uh, tooth number nine Emax crown shade A2. Now, what are the chances that this patient's tooth is like a dead ringer for the A2? I mean, just start. If you go to Smile Line USA, it's this great Italian company that actually sends, um, that actually has for the iPhone, an attachment that you put on there. So it's color corrected, 5500 Kelvin degree light. And you just take it right on, you know, put the shade tab in place or your assistant holds it and you take the picture right on your iPhone and send it to your lab. No more excuses about not using dental photography now that you can do it with an iPhone. You don't need to go buy a DSLR. So that's over too. And, and the excuses are over about doing bad preps too. I mean, it's just not, it's not necessary. It's, um, so I don't, to dentists who complain that they don't have talent, I don't accept that anymore because I can show them how to get better restorative results without having to have an increase uh, in talent. So I, I just think that excuse is over thanks to all the technology that we have in dentistry. That's awesome. I'm really excited about uh, your future because uh, I have followed your, you know, your entire career since you left private practice and uh, you, you've made an immeasurable uh, benefit in my personal career. And I really enjoyed you uh, when you were with um, Serona and uh, <laughs> Uh, I know that that ship has sailed and maybe that's, there's more, there's more for a part two, if you're willing to come back for a part two, uh, interview oh, yeah. with us. I love that. Anytime. Yeah. I love, yeah. The, I, I love doing stuff like this and uh, especially with you. So that'd be great, Greg. Love to do that. Okay. Awesome. Well, I just want to point our listeners of where to find you. You can go to uh, drdetola.com and um, he's doing quite a bit of speaking still. And uh, when do you think the, um, the live videos will start rolling out? When do you think that's going to be? Oh, uh, that's a, that's a little harder to say. We, we just launched something called um, product talk where I'm going around. Uh, I, I fly to um, a KOL's office and uh, talk to them about um, their favorite new product they're using, or maybe a favorite classic product. And um, we go set up like in their reception area. And so we get to know them a little bit and then they, they just kind of talk and then they share a case with me. And so that one's easier to do because they're capturing the clinical photography and stuff like that. Um, this other one, we, we still have um, some logistic work to do before we figure it out. We're still working on the right lighting rigs and all that stuff. When we shot all that stuff at Glidewell, in addition to the $70,000 camera, there was lights mounted in the ceiling. There was plenty of room around the chairs, like a 20 by 20 room. And we have to figure out how to be able to scale all this and still make it look good in kind of a standard 10 by 10 operatory and still be able to kind of make it work. We considered building like this master operatory and flying in the KOLs, but I, I don't know if you've ever done dentistry uh, somewhere else besides your own office. It is not uh, comfortable. Yeah. You always wish you had something that was back at the office. You're not used to where the chair is. You're not used to where anything is. So it's really tough to get dentists to do their best dentistry if you pull them out of their office. So we, we still need to just finish the planning on 
on being able to do that. But uh, certainly this year in 2019, we'll produce and start distribution. Well, I'd love to, if, if there's anything relevant that I could discuss, I'd love to have you guys come down here, especially uh, in the wintertime when everybody else is freezing, wherever you yeah. are. Yeah, come on down. It'd be fun. That'd be great. Well, Mike, I really enjoyed having you on the uh, podcast and hopefully we can have a part two because I think you and I can go on for a couple hours. I want to, I'd love to touch on the whole Serona portion of your career and, um, and, and onward from there. That was, All uh, right. so uh, I'll hit you up and we'll definitely do a part two if you're down with that. That'd be great, Craig. I really enjoyed it today. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, and thanks, thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Take care, guys.